measurements at the plant or the soil. And now we start with discussing the use of plant measuring measurements for irrigation scheduling. We will be revising first the visual symptoms, measurements of growth, plant water potential, stomatal conductance, canopy temperature, subflow, or stem water content. The most simple way of deciding if you need irrigation is by looking at your crop. It, that's as simple as that, but or also as complicated as that, because you need to have a lot of experience to use visual symptoms to assess the water status of the crop. Has a lot of drawbacks because it is very difficult to establish general criteria in terms of symptoms. There is a lot of variation between species, cultivars, and also many times the symptoms of, of water stress might be similar to symptoms of other limiting factors. Also, if you observe water stress in the crop, then that is very late. It's a very late indicator of water stress. And also, it does not provide any information on the dose that we need to apply. Some of the symptoms that have been used in the past for detecting water stress, we have here some examples, like the darker color of young leaves in the case of beans, Faseolus. Leaf rolling is a very common symptom of water stress in grasses. Also the change in leaf orientation that can occur in sorghum or beans, also in grasses. Temporary wilt, like uh, that occurring in the sugar beet. The loss of leaves in almonds, that, but that's a very late symptom of water stress. So water stress has to be very severe. The rigidity and dark coloration of the stem of the terminal shoot in cotton. And in general, we can always detect stress plants in parts of the field by looking at the smaller plants in terms of height or leaf area. Here you see an example, something that we can observe in a, in a stress maize crop where we see leaf rolling but also the leaf angle changes, tends to be more vertical. The same goes for a wheat crop and the water stress. You see the leaves are rolling and also they have a more vertical appearance. In some cases we can detect the water stress by dehydration of the fruits, in this case olive trees. Under more severe water stress conditions we will observe loss of turgor, leaf curling or change in leaf angle in the case of olives. And finally when the water stress, stress is extreme we will observe dead leaves or even dead shoot sections. Something a little more uh, accurate for detecting water stress is doing measurements of expansive growth. You already know that uh, growth is the most sensitive process to water deficits. And therefore, if we can measure growth, that will be a very early water stress detector. We can measure growth by measuring length, like the plant height or the leaf length. We can also measure plant leaf area. We can measure the volume of fruits. But then, then if we want to use that to detect water stress, we will need to have some plants under well water conditions that, we will, that will serve as the control. Of course, this method only serves when we have uh, expansive growth occurring. And it has a problem because expansive growth is affected by not only by soil water, but also by evaporative demand, by ETO, by reference evapotranspiration. 
Raising in the level of complexity, we could measure the plant water potential. Usually, what we do is measure the leaf water potential. It is the best indicator of water status of the plant because basically we talk about water stress when the water potential becomes quite neg very negative. So it is a direct measurement of the water status. It is easily measurable with a pressure chamber, but it is destructive, of course, so we need to cut leaves and then put the leaves in the pressure chamber to get the, the measurement. It has a typical variation, we will see now, or we will see later, and the maximum value of plant water potential occurs before sunrise the so-called predon. Some, well, basically the leaf water potential before sunrise is quite close to the mean soil water potential. I have put there a question mark indicating that not always the predon leaf water potential will be equal to the soil water potential. Think about it. If the night is long enough and the evaporative demand is not too high, the plant will have time enough during the night to equilibrate the water potential of the plant with the water potential of the soil. So they will be equal. But if the level of stress is very high, we have very little water left in the soil and the nights are not too long, we are in the summer, it might occur that the rehydration of the plant during the night is not enough to reach the same level in the plant as in the soil. So sometimes under extreme water stress, the predominant leaf water potential will not be equal to the water potential of the soil. Problems about using the plant water potential. Well, first and very importantly, it depends on the evaporative demand. The more evaporative demand that you have, the lower will be the water potential. It is also dependent on the species and the development phase. So it is very difficult to establish general rules of what is the plant water potential that indicates that we need irrigation. Changes with the species, changes through the growth cycle, so it's, it's not easy to to define. In some cases, the use of water potential has been successful, like in the case of cotton using the midday leaf water potential. Here you have the typical time course of leaf water potential during the day for a control irrigated trees. This is olives in Larina. This is a, a farm close to Cordoba, 2013. And here we see that the maximum potential occurs be just before sunrise. And then it decrease, decreases during the day. And we have a plateau during the midday, during the central hours. And then we have a recovery of potential in the late afternoon. This is a control irrigated tree and this is a water deficit, well it was a deficit irrigation irrigated tree. You see that the deficit irrigated tree has much lower values of leaf water potential, but the time course is similar. So we have a plateau midday, higher values before sunrise, and, uh, and the values recover in the late afternoon. Here you see the time course of solar radiation. This indicates this is a fully clear day in the summer in Cordoba. But the idea is that as you have so many hours in the plateau, you could use a measurement even here or here or here. And so you have a lot of time to perform the measurements. 
Here we represent the time course during the year of the leaf water potential at midday for three different irrigated treatments in Cordoba. This is the uh, this is 2006 as, I, as far as I remember. So the during the winter and spring the three treatments were equal and then we have a control this is the well irrigated trees and then we have this is a continuous deficit irrigation so we are applying deficit irrigation but the same amount during the whole irrigated period this is the irrigated period from here to here and this is a regulated deficit irrigation this is the triangles the regulated deficit irrigation cuts more the irrigation during the summer and less in spring or autumn. As we cut the irrigation during the summer, the water potential goes to much more negative values. Well, this is a scheme to represent how we measure leaf water potential. We use a pressure chamber. This is a steel cylinder. And then we put here a leaf with the pestle coming out and then we apply pressure inside the chamber and then we have here a manometer to measure the pressure and we observe when the, uh, a small drop of water appears here. When the water appears here, the amount of pressure that we have applied is equal to the water potential of the leaf. In this table, you see what are the threshold levels of leaf water potential for different species marking the start of a stomatal closure. If you look at this, you will see that in general, the values to produce stomatal closure are around from 10 to 15, typically. Some cases, the values are lower than that, but always less than 20 bars, less than two megapascal of leaf water potential. Okay. The problem with leaf water potential is that if you want to make a measurement of predon leaf water potential, you have to go there five o'clock in the morning. And that's not quite convenient. I mean, if you don't love to wake up so early, that's not convenient. Or even if you go at midday, imagine going to measure at noon in Cordoba in the middle of summer with 44 degrees to go to the field, take the samples and do the measurements and stay there for two, three hours doing the measurements. That's not convenient. So we have been trying to produce different indexes based on plant measurements. And the most important probably is the canopy temperature. I only give uh, a few ideas because later in this class you will have a specific talk on irrigation scheduling using sensors that will focus mostly on canopy temperature. Just a few ideas about it. First of all is that the lower transpiration always means an increase in the canopy temperature. But the increase in temperature depends on the energy balance, depends on what is the net radiation, depends on wind speed, depends on humidity. An important idea to remember is that cooling by transpiration of plants or animals increases with the vapor pressure deficit. So the more dry the air is, the higher the cooling by transpiration. If we use canopy temperature as an index for irrigation scheduling, we have to remember that canopy temperature will reflect stomatal closure. Therefore, it will be a late indicator of stress. Another important idea is that it is better to use as indicator of stress the difference between canopy temperature and air temperature rather than use directly 
canopy temperature alone. Using canopy temperature, we can produce different indexes and the most widely used is the crop water stress index, which is calculated according to that formula that says that uses always the difference between temperature of the canopy and temperature of the air. And we do a measurement of that. We measure Tc minus Ta actual. That's what we measure. And we need to know the minimum value for that variable and the maximum value for that variable. According to that definition, we will have that when we have no water stress, the crop water stress index will be zero, while when the stress is maximum, in other words, if we have zero transpiration, the crop water stress index will be equal to one. Some people have proposed a general threshold of 0 0.25, but that, that is not clear at all for all species. In principle, this idea can be applied only to crops under full cover. And the important or the more complicated thing about this method is not measuring the temperature, which is pretty easy, but to define the minimum and maximum values of that difference between the canopy and the air temperature. As we said before, as the crops do not heat up when the air is quite humid, we said that the cooling is higher when we have dry air. If the air is very humid, then the crops do not cool much due to transpiration. So the crop water stress index is useless in humid areas. Here we see a picture of how canopy temperature was measured in the early days of these methods. People used a pistol, which is a, an infrared thermometer. They pointed the, the pistol to the crop and then they got a measurement of canopy temperature. Here you see an example of differences between a control irrigated treatment, a full would be full irrigation, is the blue line, and we have also a regulated deficit irrigation, is the red line. You see, this is pistachio in California, 2006, and you see that, well, during the night there is almost no difference, and then during the day, the pistachios are cooler than the air throughout the whole period. And the cooling is much more important in the case of the full irrigation. The deficit irrigated uh, treatment is about five to six degrees hotter than the full irrigated treatment. So you see that in pistachio, canopy temperature is quite sensitive two differences in water supply. So in this case, this is a very good indicator of water stress. Here we see for the same experiment in Madera County in California, as well, this was uh, performed by Luca Testi. And here you see the value of crop water stress index for the, those two treatments during the summer and you, the deficit irrigated treatment had lower irrigation until this point, and then it had the same irrigation as the other. Well, you see that during the low irrigation period, the RDI, the regulated deficit irrigation, had a much higher crop water stress index than the control. The control is basically around the zero line, which means that it had almost no water stress. When the irrigation was increased for the RDI, the crop water stress index decreased from 0 0.6 to 0 0.2. So the water stress was reduced for the RDI, but even then it did not reach the values of the control treatment. So you see here that the crop water stress index looks 
quite sensitive to water deficit in the case of pistachio. Okay, another index of water stress can be measuring the stem diameter oscillations. And to do that, we use displacement sensors, the so-called Linear Variable Differential Transformer, LVDT, which is a, something that you can use to measure changes in position of any solid. In trees, basically, in plants in general, we can see stem cycles of 24 hour of stem contraction and expansion following the transpiration of the plant. The idea, the original idea, is that when water stress increases, we will have more, uh, we will have more contractions in the stem. This idea has been investigated for the irrigation of fruit trees, but has a lot of practical problems for deployment. Here yeah, we see an example of a sensor um, located on a tree. This is an LVDT. So we can measure the diameter from here to here with very high resolution. Here we see an example of data in Córdoba, 2013, in La Rina, the same orchard that we have commented before. This is an orchard close to Córdoba, a super intensive orchard. And we see the diameter variation measured with LVDTs for a control treatment. This is the red line. And also for a deficit irrigated treatment. This is the black line. This LBDT was uh, installed over a branch, not over the trunk. Why over a branch? Because a branch is, is more plastic, can have a higher contractions. And therefore, but you see that in this case, the control has a higher oscillation in diameter than the deficit tree. Here we see the time course of solar radiation, this dotted blue line, and look what happens in this day. We had some cloudy conditions after 15 hours, and you see what happens, that the water status of the tree improved. So, so instead, so there was a recovery in the water status, and then when the sun appears again, like here, we see that there is also a decrease in the water status. There is a, an increase in the variation of the diameter. We see also that even the water deficit treatment responded in terms of the diameter variation to this small peak, like you see here, you see here. So the diameter variation represents more or less the variations in the water status of the plant. The difficult part is converting this to numbers, to quantities, in terms of deciding what is the right moment for irrigating. Well, we have said that sometimes we can use indexes that are based on the growth which is quite sensitive to water deficit, but we can go directly and measure the stomatal conductance. And we can do that using a porometer. And the main problem of measuring stomatal conductance is that the variability among leaves is huge. Apart from that, apart from having a lot of differences among leaves, there is a large impact of the environment, basically of the vapor pressure deficit and the radiation environment on the actual value of stomatal conductance. So it is not easy to interpret values that we measure. Apart from that, we have already commented that anything related to stomatal closure is a late index of, ex of stress. 
and as I said, it is difficult to implement in practical conditions. Here we see a guy doing a measurement with a leaf barometer. So we put the leaf in, in this uh, clamp and we can get a measurement of uh, leaf conductance in say less than one minute. But the problem is that we only measure one leaf. So if we want to get a good measurement, we need to measure a lot of leaves. That is not very practical. Here we see some examples of measurements of a stomatal conductance, in this case in Pitch, La Veguilla, close to Córdoba, in 2008. These are basically summer data. And we have two treatments here. The normal irrigated treatment was that that the farm was following and we had a treatment where we doubled the number of drippers so the amount of irrigation was double like the, that applied by the farmer before well uh, from this moment on we see that applying double irrigation increases the stomatal the mean stomatal conductance over what the farmer does which means that the amounts of irrigation that the farmer was applying during August was less than being used by the crop. And that was reflected in terms of stomatal conductance. But even though you can capture changes, variations in stomatal conductance during the year, you see that the maximum values are changing during the season. And this is associated partly to the aging of the leaves, but partly also to the environmental conditions. So stomatal conductance is not a very good alternative. We can go and directly measure subflow, which basically will be equal over long periods to transpiration. To measure subflow, we can use different methods um, let me just mention the heat pulse method which, which is probably the best the heat balance which is also good for a small stems heat pulse can be used even in very large trees but the heat balance only serves for very small trees or the heat deformation which is not as good as the other two but subflow has been only practice or practical in trees. It is an invasive method and is rather complex. It also requires calibration if we want to get actual transpiration data and has the problem of the variability around the trunk perimeter. Here you see an example of a sensor or compensated heat poles. This is the sensors that we have developed here at the Institute. And in the compensated heat poles method, we put three needles that we insert into the tree. The central needle is a heater. So this is a resistance. And we have two needles that have se temperature sensors inside here, here, here. In this, in this uh, type of sensor, we have four depths. And at the heater, we applied a short pulse of heat. And then we follow the temperature variations above and below the stream of water. And by looking and uh, analyzing these temperature variations during the period after the heat pulse, we can detect, we can deduce the subflow that is going in this direction. Here we see some data obtained with such um, an instrument. This is the same day in La Arena in August 2013 that we have already seen with the trunk diameter variation and we see that the subflow is much more sensitive as you can see here to the environmental conditions look at this when the solar radiation reduces 
the transpiration also the soft flow also is quite reduced look at the huge differences between the control tree and the deficit tree but even the deficit tree transpiration responds to this variation to these cloudy conditions here and then the sun comes up again and the transpiration increases for both the control and the deficit tree if we superimpose the two the diameter variation and the subflow you see that basically the two curves are interrelated so we see that when we have this blue line corresponds to this blue line this is transpiration this is diameter variation but we see that when we have more transpiration when we have more transpiration we have more contraction of the stem and if we have less transpiration like here we reduce the contraction of the stem finally among the plant-based methods i would like to mention sapwood water content as a possible variable to detect plant water stress basically in the case of trees and it will depend on the species in some species the variation in sapwood water content might be important in others it is not very important to measure sapwood water content we can use TDR, time domain reflectometry, or electrical resistance, which is much cheaper. But this is an invasive method, and <coughs> basically, if we use electrical resistance, it takes quite a long time to equilibrate. I mean, you insert the sensor into the tree, and it will take, in the case of resistances, might take more than one month to equilibrate with the subwood. If we want to get absolute values of water content, it, we will require a specific calibration. Here we see an example of applying this idea to olive trees, in this case in Cordoba in 2006, in olive trees with th three different treatments, a control, is the black line, and two deficit irrigation treatments. The uh, the red and the green we see that there is not well instead of water content we have here subwood heat capacity but this is linearly related to subwood water content so basically they represent basically the same you see that during the summer the well irrigated trees keep a higher water content than the deficit irrigated trees like the red or the green then when we have the rain at, during the start of autumn the water content increases in all of them and then there is a decrease during the winter Us usually what happens is that olive trees during the winter suffer from water stress but this is another another story 